Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about Aristotle's Poetics. We are going to focus on the theory of mimesis. Aristotle is an ancient Greek philosopher and scientist. He is considered one of the greatest intellectual figures of Western history. Aristotle's Poetics, written around 335 BCE, is the oldest surviving work of literary theory. And literary theory is an area of study that is concerned with the analysis of literature. Aristotle's poetics is quite lengthy, and today we are going to focus on two things. Number one, how Aristotle's opinions differ from Plato's, and number two, the theory of mimesis. And mimesis here means imitation. Aristotle's poetics was preceded by Plato's The Republic. And in the Republic, Plato presents his theory of forms, arguing that the objects in this world are imitations of ideal forms that are the true reality. What does this mean? Let's take an example. According to Plato, a share in this world, in our material world, is just an imitation of the form of the chair in the ideal world of forms. So, that being the case, art is twice removed from reality, as it's just an imitation of an imitation. A painting of a chair is just an imitation of a chair, which is in turn an imitation of the form of chair. So, simply put, Plato regards our world as an imitation of another world. This other word is a word of ideal forms. So, this word is abstract, it's not material, and our entire word is an imitation or a copy of this word. So, when a painter, for example, paints a painting of a chair, he is imitating the chair that is in the real world, right? And the chair that is in the real world is an imitation of the form of the chair in the ideal world of forms. So according to Plato, art, whether it's painting or literature or any other kind of art that imitates the real world, is an imitation of an imitation, because the real world itself is an imitation. So according to Plato's theory of forms, the real world is the world of ideas, which contains the ideal forms of everything. So we have a world that is made up of ideas, and everything that is in our world is present in this world, in the form of ideal forms. And according to Plato, we are born with the concepts of these ideal forms in our minds. So, it's like we have an innate knowledge of these forms. And the illusory world in which we live, the world of the senses, because we perceive it through our five senses, contains imperfect copies of the ideal forms. So, this means that our world is illusory. It is just a mere illusion. Why? Because... Everything around us is just a copy of its ideal form. And according to Plato, we recognize things in this world, anything such as dogs, for example, because we recognize they are imperfect copies of the concepts in our minds. So what he means to say is when you see a dog or a chair or a table, you know that this is a dog or this is a chair or this is a table, because you have an innate knowledge of the perfect form of this thing in your mind. So, everything in this world is a shadow of its ideal form in the world of ideas. Let's take another example. According to Plato's theory of forms, every horse that we encounter in the world around us is a lesser version of an ideal or perfect horse that exists in a world of forms or ideas, a realm that humans can only access through their ability to reason. 
So as you can see before you in the picture, it is as if the word of the senses is just an imitation or a copy of the word of ideas. So the horse is just a copy of the perfect ideal form of the horse. And we can only access this word of ideal forms through our minds, through reason. In his Poetics, Aristotle turned Plato's theory on its head. Far from mistrusting our senses, Aristotle relied on them for the evidence to back up his theories. What he learned from studying the natural world was that by observing the characteristics of every example of a particular plant or animal that he came across, he could build up a complete picture of what it was that distinguished it from other plants or animals and deduce what makes it what it is. So unlike Plato, Aristotle focuses on our word, our word of the senses. Indeed, Aristotle believes that you can determine that this flower is a rose, for instance, through observing the characteristics of this flower through your senses. If you focus on a rose, you will find that it has a red color, that its petals are shaped in a certain way. And so you deduce that this is a rose. The same goes for any other thing. If you focus, for example, on a nightingale, which is a kind of bird, you will be able to deduce that this bird is a nightingale by focusing on its characteristics through your senses. For example, you can focus on the way it sounds, on the shape of its beak, on the color of its feathers, and determine whether it's a nightingale or not. This is a quote by Aristotle, the senses are gateways to the intelligence. There is nothing in the intelligence which didn't first pass through the senses. The intelligence here, of course, means knowledge. So according to Aristotle, we acquire knowledge through our senses. We observe the world around us and we gain knowledge. In Raphael's famous painting, The School of Athens, Plato, who is painted on the left, points upwards to the heavenly world of forms, while his pupil Aristotle reaches out into the real world, showing the difference between their philosophies. So The School of Athens is a very famous Renaissance painting by the Italian painter Raphael, and as you can see, he has painted Plato and Aristotle as a part of his painting, and Plato's arm is pointing upwards to the world of the ideal forms, while Aristotle's hand is reaching into the real world. So this is the difference between their philosophies. And this is how art imitates life. This painting is, of course, an expression of art, and it imitates Plato's and Aristotle's ideas and beliefs. Moving on to mimesis. Aristotle's poetics is particularly concerned with mimesis, a Greek word used within literary theory and philosophy that loosely translates to representation or imitation. So mimesis means to represent something or to imitate something. In ancient Greece, art was considered mimetic. This means that in one way or another, all art is a representation or imitation of nature, including human nature. And I guess we have seen this in Raphael's painting because he imitated human nature. He imitated the opinions of Plato and Aristotle in his painting. So art is the representation or replication of something beautiful or meaningful. The same applies to literature. If a writer is writing about human nature, how people are good or bad, if he is showing their virtues and their sins, then he is imitating human nature. So all kinds of art are indeed mimetic. Let's discuss Plato's opinion about poetry. 
And by poetry here, I mean fiction, because poetry was one of the most widespread types of literature back in ancient Greece. So, in the Republic, Plato objected to poetry on two grounds. Number one, poetry doesn't lead to truth like philosophy does. Instead, it drives us away from it, as poetry is a copy of a copy, since the real word is a mere imitation of the word of ideas. So again, back to the theory of ideal forms. According to Plato, we can reach this realm of ideal forms through philosophy. However, art or poetry in this case drives us away from the realm of ideal forms because poetry is an imitation or a copy of the word of the senses, the word in which we live. And this word is an imitation or a copy of the word of ideal forms or the real word in Plato's opinion. This is why Plato believes that poetry is a copy of a copy because it's just an imitation of the word of the senses that we live in, and this word is itself an imitation of the word of ideal forms. Number two, poetry depends on emotion rather than logic. The poet could thus persuade people to do immoral things. This is why Plato perceived poets as immoral and banished them from his republic. Plato prefers logic to emotion. Plato believes that since poets depend on emotion to persuade people, they can persuade people to do immoral things through evoking certain emotions in them, such as lust or anger. So for him, poets were immoral because sometimes they focused on immoral subjects. These are the two reasons why Plato objected to poetry. What about Aristotle? Aristotle argues that the human tendency to create art and poetry comes from a natural instinct for imitation. This is how humans are different from animals as people learn through imitation and have a strong inclination to imitate people and things. So Aristotle believes that it's completely natural for us to want to imitate this world in which we live in and that this kind of imitation is a way of learning. Indeed, children learn language through imitating the adults around them. And of course, we all learn and gain knowledge from reading literature. Furthermore, Aristotle claims that human beings find universal pleasure in imitations. People naturally take pleasure in looking at an accurate imitation of an object or reading a work of art that presents universal truths. So Aristotle's second point is that art's imitation of our world and our human nature brings pleasure to people when they read it or look at it. If, for example, you look at an imitation of an object, if you look at a painting that portrays the sea and the sky and nature, you will find pleasure. And the same thing happens when you read a work of art that presents universal truths. When you read about universal themes such as love, death, loss, and grief, you will derive pleasure because you yourself have been through all of these things. This is why Shakespeare's plays and works are still enjoyed till this very day because they include universal truths. These two points could be found in this quotation by Aristotle for imitation is natural to man from his infancy. Man differs from other animals particularly in this, that he is imitative and acquires his rudiments of knowledge in this way. Besides, the delight in it is universal. So these are the two points that we have discussed. Number one, that imitation is natural to human beings and this occurs from infancy because, as we have said, children learn language through imitating adults. And number two, that human beings find delight in imitating things. Rudiments, of course, means principles. According to Aristotle, all forms of poetry, whether it's tragedy, epic poetry or comedy, are forms of imitation 
and can only differ in three ways. Number one, the medium of imitation, or the means through which the artist imitates the object. Number two, the object of imitation, the thing that we are imitating. And number three, the mode of imitation, or the way the artist imitates this object of imitation. So let's examine these three distinctions. The first kind of distinction is the means the poets employ. Just as a painter employs paint and a sculptor employs tone, the poet employs language, rhythm, and harmony, either singly or in combinations. Music combines both rhythm and harmony, while dance uses only the rhythmical movement of the dancers to convey its message. So the medium of imitation is the means that the poets employ. For example, a painter uses paint to paint his paintings, and a sculptor uses stone or marble to sculpt his works of art, while a poet employs language, rhythm, and harmony. Each of these mediums could be used on its own or it could be used in combination with another medium. For example, music combines rhythm and harmony, while dance only uses rhythm. In tragedy, comedy and some kinds of poetry, rhythm, language and harmony are all used. In some cases, as in dithyrambic poetry, all three are used together while in other cases, as in comedy or tragedy, the different parts come into play at different times. So Aristotle gives us examples of how language, rhythm, and harmony could be used. In dithyrambic poetry, which was an ancient Greek hymn and dance that was performed in honor of Dionysus, and Dionysus is the Greek god of wine and theater, so, the theorembic poetry included language, of course, any kind of poetry includes language, rhythm and harmony because it was a hymn and a dance. So, it included all three mediums. In comedies and tragedies, which are performed in theaters, different parts or different mediums come into play at different times. For example, language is used during dialogues, rhythm is used during performative dances, and harmony is used during the chorus. Moving on to the object of imitation. The second distinction is the objects that are imitated. All poetry represents actions with agents who are either better than us, worse than us, or quite like us. So again, I would like to remind you that poetry here means literature, not just poetry. What is the object of imitation? It's, of course, people. People who do certain actions. And these people could be better than us, worse than us, or quite like us. For instance, tragedy and epic poetry deal with characters who are better than us, because epic poetry usually narrates the adventures of heroes. So, heroes are usually idolized. They are better than us. While comedy and parody deal with characters who are worse than us. Because characters in comedies are often ridiculous. Their traits are exaggerated. They might be portrayed as people who lack intelligence or people who do embarrassing things so that you would laugh at them. And so, these characters are usually worse than us. You can also find people who are quite like us. This is more common in modern literature. But in ancient Greece, usually characters were either better or worse than regular people, while characters who were normal were usually only present in historical accounts. Lastly, we move to the mood of imitation, which is divided into narrative and dramatic presentation. The mode of imitation is the manner or the way in which the poet presents his work. So back then, it could either be narrative or dramatic presentation. In a narrative, like epic poetry, 
The poet represents a course of events as a story, either assuming the perspective of another person or speaking directly to the audience in his or her own person. So this means that in a narrative such as Homer's The Iliad or The Odyssey, the poet represents a course of events. So he narrates a plot, a story, and he could either narrate the story through another character or he could speak directly to us. So the poem could be written in the third person, while in a dramatic presentation, such as a tragedy or a comedy, a course of events is placed before us by means of actors who represent the events by taking on the roles of different persons involved. So in a dramatic presentation, we don't have a narrator. The plot is placed before us and it's acted out by actors. So narration is of course present in epic poetry, while dramatic presentation is present in the theater, tragedy or comedy. So to sum up, for Aristotle, imitation and therefore the creation of art and poetry is simply human nature and will always be a part of the human experience. So Aristotle believes that imitation or mimesis is a natural instinct. It's a part of our nature and we should be able to mimic or imitate human nature in our works of art. We have come to the end of our lecture. You can find some extra resources in the description below and some videos that will help you understand different points, such as why Plato hates poetry, Aristotle's case for poetry, what is mimesis, Aristotle's mediums of art, and the difference between comedy and tragedy. Thank you for watching this lecture and stay tuned for our next lecture about Aristotle's poetics.